The most difficult thing in this film was simulating the effects of these large-scale tornadoes. To me, I look around at the 100 mile an hour fan and the rain towers and I just sort of go, ooh, this is big. It made everything as real as, as, as can be. You're more reacting than you are acting. It gets you really the adrenaline pumping. It's so exciting. Our actors had to play in the rain probably about a third of the film. Trey, put the camera down and get on the bus! So I showed up one of the first days to set and there are these huge cranes. I mean, the largest cranes I've ever seen. I was like, what are those for? They're like, those are the rain towers. And I was like, of course they are. It's great fun to get wet and then after a while you're like, will you please just turn off that rain machine and stop throwing leaves in my face? just surviving. You're literally thinking this is happening and you're trying to run to shelter. When I read the script, I read it for the story and I thought the story was really kind of moving and touching and personal and human and, and I wanted to be a part of it. And then we got into production and I went, wait, I'm sorry, I'm wet from where to where? This was my first rain shot ever, which I've always been kind of worried about because I thought it would always be kind of miserable, but it's actually one of the most fun things ever. For the film to work, it needs to be as real and raw as it can be. You don't want it to ever look like you're making anything that's fantasy or fiction. So when you're on set, you actually are kind of brought into this world, and you really feel like you've been through a tornado. And action! We were literally getting golf ball-sized hailstones thrown at us. In those moments, as you finish a scene, your heart is still racing. You're actually breaking a sweat now. It feels like you just ran through a tornado. I didn't expect to be running towards a truck which was falling out of the sky 10 meters in front of me. Three, two, one, action! It's cool because there's not that much that we have to imagine because it's crazy enough just trying to get from point A to point B in the scene. All the actors were really game and did some amazing wire rigs with wind blowing and stuff like that. So it was great to see everybody, you know, stepping up to the challenges. They stick you on a rig and some guy is holding onto a rope and jumps off a ladder. And you go and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it is. It's a lot of fun. So I had this wire attached to my back and this harness that came around and they're pulling me, pulling me, and then up I went about 40 feet in the air. Got a little lift, then came back, then lift. Kind of very real. It was pretty awesome. Dad, please help us! The building fell down on top of us and there's water pouring in. I, I don't know how long we've gone. When we were in the pit, it was really overwhelming. I think we need to do a cue with the megaphone once the water cue is here. Sure. sure. And then well, I can say listen. Yeah, when Everyone he says listen, yeah. then you can say the action cue. Sure. Oh, boy. Listen! Nobody move! I mean, it really was a tight eight-foot pit. We had metal, you know, metal over the top of us and, and uh, rubble. Uh, and it was kind of, you know, kind of no, no acting required once you're in there, particularly when it, when it begins to fill with water. There was so much going on, you know, so much water pouring in at times and, and so much just water surrounding us and then there's, it's, you, it would get cold and so to then do really emotional performances on top of that, it, it can be quite difficult. In the script it says, you know, Gary jumps in and, and rescues Donnie and the top of the water is being hit by, by the rainstorm and sort of I'm hanging upside down with a knife trying to, trying to free him, so it, it's anything but usual. Uh, take that. Okay. Uh, I got you. Come on. There's no issues here. It's okay. okay. <laughs> I love you, son. We got him now. We got him now. It ultimately gives the actors a completely realistic environment of which to act and react in. They create these sets that really add to the intimacy and the, and the fear of the scene. As an actor, I don't think I could necessarily even simulate that on my own within my head. I had no bearing for what it was really like to experience that power like that, to feel Mother Nature attacking. There was a, a weird sense of 
fear and thrill. I thought this is how it must be because I've never seen a tornado before, but it must be terrifying seeing this thing come towards you. This is part of why you do a movie like this, because how many times in your life do you get to play in this kind of a playground? As an extreme storm chaser, we see tornadoes of all different shapes and sizes. But you can get yourself in a real bad spot, and these are the most deadly natural phenomena on the planet. Hang on! Shit, this is crazy! I have a lot of respect for the storm chasers who are out there doing work trying to learn more about these tornadoes. Every storm chaser has different goals. There are the, the storm chasers that are trying to capture an incredible video. Then the research storm chasers trying to collect that valuable piece of data inside a tornado that will help us better understand the mysteries behind them and try to realize just how strong the wind speeds get, especially right near the ground. But in this movie, this storm cell hangs around for four hours over one particular area. So there's a number of different tornadoes that occur during that system. A wedge tornado, by definition, is wider than it is tall. And usually the strongest tornadoes are the wedges. Which is this enormous machine of destruction that can have wind speeds as high as 300 miles per hour. That can just rip buildings and roofs off like they're just styrofoam. And to capture that uh, was very intriguing to me. And there was an EF-5 on April 27, 2011 super outbreak in Mississippi that dug a trench in the ground that was two feet deep, 50 yards wide and 500 yards long. And that's the first case that I've heard of that. And Dr. Fujita, that came up with the rating scale. F-0 is the weakest tornadoes and F-5 are the strongest. And they've since changed it to the enhanced Fujita scale. So you can have an EF-5 tornado that's 20 feet across that has 200 mile an hour or greater wind speeds. And you can also have a mile wide tornado that's weak. Uh, that's an EF-0 or EF-1. Uh, but Dr. Fujita theorized that tornadoes could get strong enough to dig that trench in the ground, but it was never observed in his lifetime. Oh my God. Oh. Yeah! Are you getting this? No, 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 no! But what makes a wedge tornado unique is that it can split into multiple tornadoes that spin around like a merry-go-round. And in those sub vortices, you can get wind speeds that are five or 600 miles per hour. And these tornadoes don't care what's in this path. They're gonna keep going. They're violent. It's almost like a, uh, you know, a, a runaway freight train that can't be stopped it's, and it's heading for certain locations. But if you have a wedge tornado that's one or two miles wide that's sitting in the same spot, that's a recipe for disaster. One of the most complicated things about making a tornado digitally is first was establishing that visual language of what type of tornado we were matching to. And I would categorize and pick my favorite selects of the different types of tornadoes. And when we went to the visual effects companies, I would put the video on the left side of screen and I'd put their digital simulation on the right. And I'd say, you gotta make it look exactly like this. Not close, but exactly. What we've discovered was this is not a movie about tornadoes. This was a movie about debris and trees and, uh, and the environment, how it interacts with the tornadoes. And then trying to find that right balance to make it really feel like this digital world is a real world and they're in fact in it. And then the other sequence is the rope tornado sequence, which is they're driving down the road and they see multiple vortices touch down in different areas, destroying houses and causing uh, total devastation. And usually a tornado will go through a life cycle. It'll touch down, uh, a lot of times it's a cone. Uh, if the conditions are right, it'll expand into a wedge tornado. And as that dry air wraps around it and chokes it off from the storm, it'll tighten it up into a rope. And that's usually the phase just before they're dissipating. But you can also get some of the strongest wind speeds in rope tornadoes because they're very concentrated in a small area. I've seen a, a small rope tornado that was very violent with intense motion hit the back end of a semi-truck and lift that up and it left the front 
and on the ground, but I've also seen a wedge tornado in Canada split into three subvortices, and then those are even splitting into multiple tornadoes as well as subvortices, and then merge back together into a wedge tornado and go back and forth again. And it all depends on its interaction with friction. So the wind is pulled into it, and they'll break up into miniature tornadoes and then go back again and oscillate. And it's those um, rope tornadoes or the, the su small suction vortices that will cause one house to sustain complete damage, whereas the one next door will be totally untouched. Then you have the fire tornado, which is actually a real phenomenon where when a tornado gets above a real fire, it sucks the fire up and creates a fire tornado. So over the hottest fires, you get intense updrafts as well, and it can tighten those into violent fire nados. And I've always wanted to measure the wind speed inside a fire nado, but you know, when you get fire, you've got bigger problems than, than the wind speed. Uh, I've also seen a tornado, for example, in southern Mississippi at night that hit a gas station and it also hit a power grid and you just saw these explosions and they quickly get engulfed by the tornado and it's so amazing scientifically that it really is almost like a living, breathing organism. And that was probably one of the more challenging things because effects companies have been able to get realistic fire. But the problem is when they put all the forces in their simulation to actually be realistic of what the tornado would be at those forces, it looked totally fake because the, it was almost hyperactive the way the wind was blowing the fire so much. But there is internet reference of an actual fire tornado that we use extensively. We wanted to make sure that that fire looked and the audience believed so much that that was real. I think the biggest thing is they did the best tries on set to create their own fire tornado, taking a bunch of fans, fuel, lighting it on fire, and trying to get a twist out of it. And there was a lot of really nice footage of that. However, our tornado is approximately 100 feet high. So the biggest challenge would probably be how, how we, we, we achieve the scale of that tornado with the fire, and it looked fantastic. supercell storms that produce the strongest tornadoes and as a extreme storm chaser those are what we're interested in and supercell storms are also capable of producing massive hail uh, baseball softball size uh, we've even seen hailstones seven eight inches in diameter uh, from supercell storms because updrafts are so intense they suspend the hail in the atmosphere until they're too big then they fall out and shatter windshields of storm chasers underneath them. The strongest of tornadoes almost have a, a mind of their own. And so I've seen tornadoes that had a bunch of tornadoes inside and you know, that it'll, it'll congeal back into one tornado, then new ones will form. And it becomes very complex uh, with a tornado. It's not just a solid tube, but you'll get all kinds of spin-ups and different vortices of all shapes and sizes and strengths. In our film, you get the unique meteorological events where you get the right storm front and you get the right humidity and temperature and all these aspects that can basically create the perfect conditions to propagate an enormous wall cloud, which is basically the beginning of a tornado. And that supercell then rotates, and if the winds and the humidity and temperature and all the factors are correct, it will develop into a tornado. There, they, there they go, they just converged. We are looking at wind speeds inside the funnel at over 300 miles per hour. This is definitely an EF5. When we were making this movie, we were talking about having this be a mile-wide tornado, and well, when we were finished shooting and in post, a real tornado occurred that was over two and a half miles wide. So our imagination of how big these storms could be, well, Mother Nature created something even bigger. The largest tornado was last year in El Reno, Oklahoma. It was the widest tornado in recorded world history at 2.6 miles wide. And we were inside that one with our armored vehicles, and there's a merry-go-round of suction vortices. There were big cone tornadoes, small ropes spinning around violently like a merry-go-round. And we were in the back side of the tornado, and it ripped our hood off, removed the hood, and we never found it again. It never hit the ground and shot off like a Frisbee. And we went back and looked at the damage and never found it. Uh, but that tornado was very unpredictable because it expanded from probably a, a quarter mile wide, half mile to 2.6 miles. And it was horrible. And it was very violent and uh, a freak of nature, definitely. Some may argue or debate whether it's because of climate change. But all we know is that in the last decade or so, we've had huge 
enormous, unprecedented storms that have wrecked havoc with uh, tons and tons of uh, communities. So it seems like the extremes are becoming more. When there are storms, they're stronger, there are more of them. And when there are not, you get drought conditions. But that's also an extreme. You know, the storms aren't the only extreme, but the absence of storms can be just as much of an anomaly. But when those storms are happening, they're getting stronger and causing more loss of life. But when I was really, really little, I remember being deathly afraid of thunder and lightning. But I think that fear turned into intense curiosity and an obsession for the science and trying to understand tornadoes and severe weather. But at this point, the data that we have inside a tornado is almost non-existent. We have a long way to go as, as tornado scientists. And so as an extreme storm chaser, we're doing research, which indirectly helps people in the path of the storms. Because if you better understand tornadoes and you know just how strong the wind speeds can get, then you can better design homes to, to withstand those really strong wind speeds and hopefully limit a lot of the loss of life from these tornadoes. vehicle, the Titus. Well, one of the interesting things we have in our film is this custom-built storm-chasing vehicle called the Titus, and it's a character in and of itself, and that's based on these real tornado-chasing vehicles. After years and years of trial and error, the Dominator 3, our newest armored vehicle, is the ultimate storm-chasing machine. It's like a uh, cross between the Batmobile and a tank. Titus was a fun one to do. When we talked about how to go about designing it, we just basically took what's required for the vehicle to function in real life, and we wanted to come up with something where the form did follow the function. Now, As real life storm chasers, the whole reason we built the vehicles is to get into tornadoes and measure the wind speeds inside of the strongest tornadoes. And we've had this thing in EF4 tornadoes. Uh, we measured wind speeds near 200 miles an hour. And if I'm gonna be in any vehicle, actually any shelter inside a tornado, I'd want to be in the Dominator 3. So we got a lot of inspiration from real of storm chasing vehicles and we wound up having it built at a company called Custom Creations here in Detroit and they did overall a phenomenal job. So it looked fantastic but unfortunately it had some problems with it. Well it leaked. Yeah it leaked it leaked pretty bad on the first day. The first day of photography Matt Walsh was in the Titus. Yeah I tell him turn the water on everything's going and next thing I know Matt's supposed to say a line and he's like we've got a breach it was like you were on the underneath decks of the Titanic. It was just you're trapped, buckled in, and there was so much water coming. It's like, I don't think we can use this. So it was to the point where Todd Garner said, I want you to paint a tiny little shark on the back of it. It's, this is our Bruce, like in Jaws. But I learned later on that the storm chasing vehicle from the storm chasing show, he was interviewed and, and asked if it was weather tight, and he said, no, it leaked like crazy. So we were right there with that. And we have a backup Titus, which is pretty good, but she leaks as well. And actually, some of the crew lovingly referred to them as Hepatitis A and Hepatitis B. <laughs> it's actually the debris inside a tornado that's more dangerous than even the raw wind speed because you had that much more momentum when there are things flying through the air and it can be very dangerous. So the exterior of the Dominator is 16-gauge steel with a polyethylene Kevlar composite spray on the outside. And we tested it by shooting two by fours at the Dominator. And with that extra coating on the outside, it prevents projectiles from going into the cabin. It also has an aerodynamic outer shell, so no wind can get underneath and, and lift us. And we added hydraulic spikes that will drill into the ground eight inches and uh, fasten us to the ground and prevent us from sliding. So we get in the path of the tornado, drop it flush to the ground like this, and let the tornado move over us. Hey, what now drop down! Stop, stop, stop! We're inside down! And the Dominator 3 has actual true bulletproof windows. So you press a button right where the tornado is about to hit, and then these protective windows pop up. Even if you had a shoulder mounted grenade launcher, it wouldn't penetrate the windows and might cause other problems. So Titus needed to at least look like it could 
withstand 200 mile per hour winds, which made it a very broad, low slung, sloping vehicle. When Titus first arrived on the set, you know, the whole crew was completely blown away and excited. The production design was incredible. It is armor plated. It looks exactly like what you would think the state of the art tornado chasing vehicle would be. It's about 12,000 pounds, half inch steel plating, so there's nothing really going to get through it. Had to have a turret on top, not unlike uh, a turret on a tank, but this one's for photography purposes. Which gives us a 360 degree view of outside. Because Pete's goal is to be right in line with a tornado and be able to get a shot looking inside the funnel of a tornado. We had these wheels custom made by uh, KMT. It's really a custom look. And the mini weather system gives us all our data in the Titus itself. And the glass is bulletproof essentially. Oh my god! Well, what makes her really special are these grappling claws. These are the outriggers, giant claws. They come out, then they extend. Then bikes go down into the ground and anchor it. We're not going anywhere with those suckers dug in. But in the end, it held up great. It could probably run for 100,000 miles the way Custom Creations built it. The Titus is shot as much from the inside as it is from the outside. So our set decorator, Brana Rosenfeld, met with one of the premier storm chasing scientists who gave her all the information on what kind of gear would be in there. And so we tried to follow that as closely as possible. We find our tornadoes uh, using all the information available to us. Yes, there's a large tornado that with large uh, debris, producing debris, destructive tornado right now, closing in on I-35. So the Dominator 3 is decked out with state-of-the-art instruments because if you're intercepting a tornado and you can't attach a number to those wind speeds, it's, it's not worth it. We have our laptop going in the upper right. And that has the GPS data so we can navigate all the farm roads. It also has uh, the real-time radar data we're tracking the storm so we can pinpoint the mesocyclones of the supercells. And that also makes it possible to storm chase at night uh, because you don't want to depend just on lightning to see where a tornado is at night, but you need to be able to track it uh, with our computers and see where the rotation is relative to our position in the storm. And on the roof of the Dominator, there's going to be a radar dome, and that's designed to scan the wind speeds inside the tornado right near the ground. Uh, we're also going to have a swivel air cannon, and that will shoot probes inside the tornado, and a parachute will deploy. They're carried around inside, and it's also decked out with cameras as well, because the visual part of science definitely can never be overlooked, and that's the fun part, is, is capture the video. And so weather service forecasters can see what storm chasers are seeing in real time in the field and you continuously relay that information to weather service forecasters and media so they can deliver it to the people in the path of the storms. So I thought it was important to show the science and I wanted the interior shots to look right and be believable. Mostly it's, it's an observational vehicle, so it was all about the cameras and the hardware for that. It's equipped with 24 surveillance cameras, so we have eyes from every angle. And then when it came to the interior, my job was much more about how are the actors going to keep busy in there. Some of it's very practical. It's about having a button for the outriggers to move. There's various monitors around the Titus that shows the graphics. There's like a quad monitor in the front that you'll see that um, has like four different images on one of the monitors. Once we actually got the vehicle, we, we had a very short amount of time. It took about a week to get everything in and working. And so I was very impressed with the teams that created Titus. It's just, it's a beast. It looks amazing. And they did a fantastic job. I think it's impossible to build a vehicle that's truly tornado proof. Even the Dominator, when it's dropped flush to the ground with the spikes deployed, if it's a strong enough tornado, we'll still go airborne. And I've seen semi trucks fly through the air, radio towers. Uh, I've seen high tension power lines pulled out of the ground by a tornado. And when you see that happening, even if we're in the Dominator 3, you know, we'll, we'll pump the brake a little bit. This is the culmination of my life's work. That means cut, Jacob. Cut it.